1963, six divers descended 10 meters below the surface of the Red Sea to spend the next 30 days in an underwater living structure that was the brainchild of Jacques Cousteau, a French naval officer who co-developed the Aqualung during the Second World War. The dynamics of life in the underworld structure named Continental Shelf Station 2, or Conshelf 2 for short, were featured in a groundbreaking French documentary film called World Without Sun and for which Cousteau received an Academy Award. Today, Conshelf 2 is an abandoned ruin in Sha'abrumi, northeast of Port Sudan, and has become one of the Red Sea's prime dive sites. Since his late teens, Ed Truter had dreamed of the fishing potential of the Red Sea's desert coasts. But it was only 25 years later, upon seeing a photograph of a dog-tooth tuna caught from a reef on spinning gear, that Ed teamed up with Rob Scott and Keith Clover of Tourette Fishing and began the pioneering steps to what has become a fly fishing destination called the Nubian Flats. Their first forays into the Red Sea in Sudan immersed them in an environment that seemed otherworldly. At times, they felt what they thought it would feel like to fish a sea on a Mars wilderness. The islands that they visited were plentiful, bountiful, and wondrous. Many of the islands were weathered hills of fossilized coral reef and a clear reminder of powerful geologic forces and the planet's constantly shifting climate. Endless flats and reefs beckoned them from hilltop vantages and became their second home for the several weeks of their first exploratory trip. It took only a few hours on the first day to convince them that the destination held great promise. Yet right from the first footwitting, more questions than answers about the enthralling environment and its sea life became the norm. This film was shot in two stages, starting with three weeks in early 2014 and followed by four weeks later in the year. The operation run by Tourette Fishing is currently of a semi-exploratory nature and is built around a motor-powered catamaran named the MY Scuba Libre, or simply called the Scuba, that travels from island to island to find the best general anchorages and locations. For the more detailed work, the scuba has two Panga-type tender boats. The successful day-to-day -day running of the scuba is dependent on a close and hard-working team of local Sudanese. The Sudanese are by and large a very generous, welcoming and friendly people, and the crew of the scuba is no exception. Tourette Fishing's head guide for the Nubian Flats operation is Mark Murray creative fly tire and super nice guy. Mark manages the rest of the guides, plans and coordinates the fishing strategies and ensures the guests' comfort and safety stays a priority. Mark has accumulated more knowledge of the inner workings of the Nubian Flats experience than most people.
The Nubian flats are a unique and diverse fishery of which a lot remains unknown. Such that every time the guide teams head out, even on the known flats, it still feels like raw exploration and it will take many seasons to truly learn just how everything on the Red Sea fits together. November 2014. Everything went wrong. Murphy arrived with a vengeance. The entire trip was constantly under the threat of extreme weather. Intense electrical storms built up to frightening levels and it even hailed in the desert. When the scuba eventually dodged the tempest and reached the islands, our opportunities were severely limited by the terrible storms. Runoff from the islands turned the flats into a mud bath, making them virtually unfishable. Despite the horrible weather, it was still obvious that the Nubian Flats are one of the prime triggerfish destinations anywhere. In good conditions, like those throughout the trip earlier in the year, guests were often greeted with hectares of tailing yellow margin and titan triggerfish scattered over the many flats. Red Sea triggers are however just as temperamental as their Seychelles cousins. But, luckily, the Nubian Flats generally offer far more triggerfish opportunities, so that anglers' chances of coming to grips with the numbers of these quite bizarre creatures is significantly higher. Even when the triggerfish are out in force and hungry, they can still be extremely frustrating, as Guy Ferguson found on an unlucky streak. Mark also got the middle trigger finger on repeat occasions. Swing away from me. Come on, baby. Okay, now I'm snag. See it, see it, see it. Come on. Objection. <laughs> yeah, eventually. I've casted at seven fish this morning and they've all refused to fly. What have you ever been offering? Suddenly I cast to this one and he, ah. Oh, That's trigger fishing. You hook them, they come off, they cut you off, they bite your flying off, they turn your hook into a paper clip. That's why I love it. You just gotta carry on and do it more and more. There's a perfect example.
with the hook in half after minute fighting. 3rd time lucky, I don't know. What can I say? <laughs> Tricky fishing will terrorize you. Fortunately, luck was with Rob and he landed the first trigger fish he saw, shortly followed by a few others. Just booked another trigger over here. Ah, oh, he's on it, he's on it, he's on it. <coughs> okay, there we go. You never know if the trigger fish is gonna stay on or not because they've got such hard mouths. I got the shakes, eh? Woo. Woo. <laughs> There's so much about them that makes them so special. It's just uh, every single fish is so unique. You never know what the fish is going to do when you cast at it. You know, you never know how it's going to react. Oh, man, they're just so, such a special fish. Anyone who's fished for them will know how these things put your heart rate through the roof. This little one here, you pull it, that's where it gets its name from. Just amazing, the teeth that it's got, the crushing power. Right here. It's not a big trigger. Nice little titan though. <laughs> the moustache or a titan trigger, you can see why, you, you know, even when you hook these fish, you don't know if you're going to land them. I mean, this one just got them on the outside of the lip there, which is a perfect place to hook them. This thing's teeth, you always got it. Oh, very nice. Really enjoyed that, eh? Yo. The fish species found on the flats are as varied as one would expect for any tropical flats destination. Trevally, mostly bluefin and GTs. There are plenty, but their presence on the flats can be unpredictable due to the highly dynamic Red Sea environment. For example, the tidal variation is very small and largely a function of the wind making any tidal predictions near impossible. It does mean though that Trevally can appear anywhere, anytime, and can catch one completely unprepared. But sometimes the stars align as they did for Rob. I'm actually really lucky to get another shot at these fish. It's just a pity that I hooked one of the small ones. With each trip, Tourette Fishing's team unravels little mysteries, and already enough has been learned to make the Nubian Flats a predictable fishery. But there's still a great sense of the unknown that keeps the destination fresh and fills each day with excited expectancy.